you this morning in the name, the love, and the joy of the Lord. And we give Him thanks that we have another day to live in Him and have our being. I'd like to thank David for the worship time. And as we go to the scriptures, join me in a quick word of prayer. Loving Lord, we thank you for this new day. We join in with the birds and their songs of praise. We thank you for life, the opportunity to live together, and the chance to get to know you better. So speak to us this morning through your word and bless our meditations and our time together. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are all well aware, we have been in this series of the cities that Paul journeyed through in Acts. And today, we have a really interesting and exciting city in Athens. I've been to Athens, and it's an amazing city. If you do get a chance to visit, I, I would strongly encourage it. Uh, it is known as the city of antiquities, uh, because the history of Athens goes back about 4,000 years almost. Uh, and so much of uh, modern day culture has been influenced by this society that was uh, born around the time of Alexander the Great. So even the Romans were influenced by the Greeks. Uh, they have a similar pantheon of gods. They, they actually cross over. Uh, so, we find Paul arriving in Athens, and as any traveler, he looked around the city, as we would if we, we were visiting Bangkok for the first time. And I'm sure, like Paul, a, a traveler in Bangkok would notice the many shrines that populate the city. I think virtually in, in every store, uh, on many street corners, if you walk down Sukhumvit, you will see some kind of shrine or offering that is placed there. But I would like to read uh, literally from Acts chapter 17. This is such an interesting account recorded for us by Luke. And there is so much that we can learn from it. So let's get going. Chapter 17 and verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Now, I'd just like to point out quickly that Paul uh, made use of the opportunities as they presented themselves. And he was in the synagogue with those who were more rigid, religiously inclined. And he also spent time in the marketplace, we're told, day by day with those who happened to be there. He didn't arrange anything. He just went down and he offered it to God and said, well, bring the right people uh, to me today and I will engage with them. So here we have in verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aeropagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who live there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Aeropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. But as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, 
I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship? And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring, referring to another poet quoted by Epicurus, that everyone is an offspring of Zeus. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. What an interesting and intriguing account of some of the time that Paul spent in Athens. So I would like to raise just three questions for us to have us have a little framework to understand this episode and Paul's time in Athens. The three questions are, one, what did Paul see? Two, what did Paul say? And three, what did Paul show us? What did Paul see? What did Paul say? And what did Paul show us? So what did Paul see? As he walked around the streets of Athens, and we are told that in Paul's time, it was easier to see an idol or a statue of a god than it was to see a human being. And someone, uh, I don't know why, uh, did account and there were no fewer than about 34,000 idols and statues and ornaments uh, around Athens. But as he looked around, he saw a community who were open to new ideas. As Luke recorded, they would gather regularly, often, perhaps daily, in this place called the Oropagus. Uh, and and it's, it's on a hill where, where the people would gather. You can see the Acropolis from there. Uh, and it's still there today. You can go to that very site. And um, here was a community that were open to new ideas. And I think we find the same in the city where we live. Uh, the people here are very hospitable. They are disinclined to, to, to turn you away. And you can always engage them. Uh, of course, we need to be sensitive as to whether they're just being hospitable or they, they are really interested to listen. And I would say that like the Greeks and the Athenians or, or the Athenians there and the Roman citizens who are there, the Thai people are very spiritually minded. We, as I've mentioned, see the shrines uh, all over the place, almost in every home here, even in the estate where I live. 
Uh, and if you walk down uh, in any public place, you frequently notice people bowing or whying to uh, some shrine or, or monument or, or uh, idol or statue, whatever it is. So I believe that there's a great similarity here in, in the community spirituality. It's different from some places where there are certain places in the Western world, I won't name any, where people just don't want to talk about spiritual things. It's all about the material. If, if I can't feel it, if I can't taste it, if I can't see it, I, I don't really want to talk about it. Uh, but this is not so where we live and neither was it so in Athens. People were open to new ideas and loved to engage in dialogue. And he saw the many idols and what piqued his interest, which was his starting point, was he said, you know, I find this curious. You are such a religious people. You honor so many different gods to the point where you even acknowledge a god you do not know. And that's such a good starting point for Paul because he says, I've come to make the one true God known to you. And I think there's a delightful point there that gladdens my heart, that our God, the creator of heaven and earth, and the ruler of the universe, is a God who wants to be known. The whole Bible that we have is a love letter of revelation of who God is, why He made us, and what He wants for us. This is great good news in my heart that our God reveals Himself. He, he wants us to know Him. He wants us to have an intimate, personal relationship. And for all of our existence into eternity, we will gain endless knowledge of who He is. Just imagine that. God is so infinite, we can never truly, completely know Him. And in all of eternity, we will be discovering new things about this infinite God. Oh, what an awesome and blessed realization that is to me. So what did Paul say? He started off by affirming them. He said, you are religious. And many of your suppositions are actually correct. So Paul said, you are right. We live and have our being in God because this was the Epicurean belief. They're, they ascribe it to Zeus. That, that Zeus is the power behind everything and Zeus existed in all things. So he was the giver of life and he was a part of everything. He says, well, that's correct, but it's only partially correct. He didn't actually say it was only partially correct. He started off by saying, yes, you are right. We live and have our being in God. But this is a God who is a personality and he can be known. Zeus to them was a concept and an idea that he exists in everything. But he, he didn't have a, a particular uh, persona, as it were, right? Uh, and then also there was a poet, uh, as Luke points out to us, that Paul was aware of the literature of the Epicureans. And one of the poets uh, that was quoted by Epicurus, actually, says that we are the offspring of God. And again, Paul jumps on that and says, you know, in many ways, you are close to the truth. We do live and have our being in God. And we are his offspring. In fact, we come from one original couple. Uh, so Paul is going back to the Jews who, were, who would have been listening, Jews who were Roman citizens, that this is in Genesis. We, we do come from one couple. And we are the offspring and the creation of God. But he moves on to point out a reality 
which to me is actually the crux of the gospel. That our God is holy. And he points out to them that there will come a day of judgment. Because you see, the Epicureans basically believe that when our earthly life is over, we basically cease to exist. And there is no further existence other than our earthly life. And so that's why the Epicureans uh, encourage worldly pleasure, as it were, to abstain from unhappiness and then to enjoy your food, to enjoy... Uh, so they, they did pronoun, um, promote the sensuality that, you know, it, it is for you to feel good in, in whatever way. So that was the Epicurean belief, and the Stoics were kind of on the other side of the coin, uh, that we should deny self, because uh, the Stoics believed that the universe was rational and human beings aren't. And so we should deny the human irrational uh, predisposition and try to uh, be closer to nature and to observe the rationality behind nature. Uh, I suppose there's a similarity to the, uh, what is it, the sus sustainable e economy, uh, that we should be sensitive to our environment and we should be a part of it. And, and uh, a common belief in our communities here in the country where we live is, is that we should deny self. Uh, I listen quite regularly to, to some of the sermons from the temple and I would say a good majority of it is in the direction of how we can deny uh, the, the earthly senses as it were and the way to happiness is, is not to indulge these weaknesses that we have. So there are many many similarities here but I think Paul brings it down to where in a cliche phrase, the rubber hits the road. And, and that is that this God is holy and there will be a day of judgment. And to prove this, to prove that He is the creator of everything and that He will bring all things to judgment, the proof of this is in the resurrection of one man who claimed to be God. And I think that is such a simple truth and easy for... You don't have to be theologically trained or educated to, to understand that, that simple truth. If you want to make a claim, you've got to back it up. It's basically what it breaks down to. So if you're going to claim you are God and all of the things that uh, have been revealed in, in the scriptures are true, then prove it. And... There is no greater proof of an almighty God than to defeat the one thing that the whole world has to bow to, and that is death. We, we know, we say the two sure things in, in life are death and income tax, and nobody escapes death. And yet that is not entirely true. There was one. In fact, I've said this several times in my sermons. I, I love the testimony of, of one of our teachers from ICS when on our Easter sunrise service, he just came up and his testimony was something like three lines. He said, as a youth, I examined all the different religions and I chose to become a Christian because only in this religion did someone come back from the dead? Think about it. There's such a myriad of, of beliefs, but no other religion makes this claim. No other belief system made, dares to make this claim that there is a power greater than death. Because all human beings are keenly aware of our mortality after we reach the age of 21. Before that, we all think we're immortal. But after that, we do become aware. Uh, 
Uh, and so that's the simplicity of it. What God claims is going to come to pass, and He has proven it and verified it by rising from the dead. So let me close with this third question. What did Paul show us? I think the lesson here is that we need to view the world through God's heart. And I choose that word carefully, not just through God's eyes, but to view the world through God's heart and not be just a tourist. Paul could have been wowed. Oh, what a beautiful city. The Acropolis was a white marble like the Taj Mahal and it would have been gleaming in the sun. It was really, they put it on, on the hill and, and it would have stood out. Imagine that long ago, such a majestic building, which is still majestic to this day. And instead of just enjoying the sights, he, he viewed his environment wherever he went through the heart of God. And, and I believe he felt the sadness, same sadness that Jesus felt as he wept over Jerusalem. It's God's heart that wants to save people. And no matter how magnificent our cities may be, no matter how capable we have become or what we have developed, we are still his offspring and he loves us. And he longs to embrace us. That is the heart of God and that's how we should view our environment. That all the people, our neighbors, the people who work for us, the people who work over us, are all offspring of God. And God wants to embrace them. And He has given us charge to tell them of His goodness, His love, His mercy. To warn them that a judgment is coming. But to give them the means of avoiding that judgment. The belief in Jesus would save them from the sentence of that judgment over our sin. So we see that Paul understood the heart of God. He understood the environment he was in. He was prepared to engage people where they were. And he took sufficient time to understand the Epicurean philosophy, to, to, to understand what the Stoics believe in, what literature were they reading, who were the popular minds of their philosophy that, that, that they uh, acknowledge. And he could then connect with them and, and find common ground. And it's no wonder that we have in the Acts that uh, there were two people who were named there, who believed, and others. So my prayer is that we should learn to engage where God has placed us. Each of us is placed in, within a context. You have your Muban or, or your condominium or your neighborhood. You have the places where you work. Uh, for the many teachers in ICS, you have the students who, who are working with you each day and, and they're watching you and, and how do we engage with these people? I think first of all we want to have the heart of God that recognizes all people as offspring of the living God and then to take joy and comfort and confidence in the fact that God wants to be known. He is not seated in some high mountain in the clouds and, and removed from mankind. We have gone through Easter and Jesus said it's finished. The veil was rent and we have access to the living God. We just need to be aware of our environment, to be sensitive to the people around us and to engage them uh, with the truth of the gospel. There are some fundamental truths, and I'll end with this, that we cannot get away from. And simply put, it is God who enables all life. 
what we have around us comes from a creator. It's not possible to have started out of nothing with no rhyme or reason and no causality. So there is a creator who enables all life. And then we are his offspring. But because he is a holy God, he will judge. And we can still be spared through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who proved all this by rising from the dead. I hope this message, this eternal message of truth and life, will uplift us afresh as we look at Paul's time in Athens. But it will encourage us to go out and and not be afraid to engage and, and to reason and to share and to give testimony and, and a logical answer to why we believe and who we believe. I would like to encourage you to, to pray for the people around you, to ask God to open doors and not to be afraid to share. You may be inclined to say that's easy for you to say, Pastor. You, you are a pastor after all and you've had a theological training and <clears throat> the experience of doing this. But let me give you a simple way forward. Just tell them your story. And you can always preface it by saying, I don't have all the answers. I'm not trying to convince you with my knowledge. I'm just trying to share what I have found. And I pray that, like Paul in Athens, we will have that share of people who believe in the living God. Have a great day. And be safe in the week ahead. Let's continue to pray for the authorities and the health of Thailand, but most of all for the salvation of Thailand. Join me in a word of prayer. Living and loving God in whom we live and have our being, we thank you for your matchless love. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son who has spared us the penalty of judgment. So quicken our hearts, put wings upon our feet as we bring the good news of the Gospel to the people you have placed us amongst, to make the unknown God known now and forever. Through Jesus Christ, who reveals all things, we pray. Amen. God bless. Thank you.